Welcome to our YouTube channel where wisdom meets inspiration. In this channel, we share valuable insights to help you become the best version of yourself. Our content is designed to uplift your spirit and enrich your life. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to stay connected with this incredible journey. Click the subscribe button below. Om Tava Katha Amritam Tapta Jeevanam Kavi Viritam Kalma Shapaham Shavana Mangalam Shri Madatatam Bhuvi Grinantiye Bhuritajana There's a lot packed in here actually. The beginning of religion is morality, ethics. So in this world, this is the place to practice ethics. Um, that's why he says, the, the, the teacher teaches the disciple about action. The first teaching is, do this and don't do that. That's the beginning of religion, do's and don'ts. You know, which turn most of us off from religion. But that's the beginning of religion, do's and don'ts, morality, ethics. Why? Why is ethics the beginning of religion? Why can't you be spiritual without being an ethical person? You cannot. You can be a good person without being particularly spiritual, but you cannot be a spiritual person without being a good person. Why not? It's this. Ethics is nothing other than an appreciation of the power of causality, that actions have consequences. Um, I saw this little kid walking ahead of me in Central Park. And he had a toy. He was walking past a, a lawn with a fence. And little, he could, he's a toddler. He was toddling along with the toy and then casually tossed the toy over the fence and went flying over and fell on the other side. <laughs> His father was walking with the pram nearby. And the kid saw that, was bewildered for a moment. Now he wanted the toy back, but he can't get it. There's a fence. <laughs> then he burst into tears. That's the superpower of kids, you know. <laughs> and he burst into tears, pointed at the toy. The father just shrugged and he said, actions have consequences, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do anything about it. <laughs> and I said, karma. And he said, he's right, it's karma. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away, a lesson in karma. They might think that's cruel, but anyway, after some time the father went around to the gate and, and then he took, the, but he let the kid get it back for himself. <laughs> they went around and... He stood, but the kid ran for it and got the toy and got it back. But yes, so actions have consequences. Now, that seems like a no-brainer, but we don't understand it. Even some of the most intelligent people among us don't understand this. Don't understand means in a theoretical way we understand it. Whereas where other people are concerned, we understand it. But not for ourselves. We somehow feel we can, we can cheat this law. Now, our actions won't have consequences. There's an ancient saying, you know, the law of karma, good, good, bad, bad. So deliberately done good action results in what we call punya or merit and that results in sukha, happiness. Deliberately done mischievous action, adharma, results in what we call um, papa, demerit. And that results in dukkha, suffering in our lives. And that's a kind of moral law. And there's a saying that, Everybody wants the results of uh, good karma without doing the karma. And everybody wants to do the bad karma without the results of bad karma. <laughs> it's like a deliberate violation of, uh, of causality. Um, I remember this um, experiment which was conducted uh, originally by the marshmallow experiment. Uh, who was it done by? Um, the 1960s. I, f I forget, very well known psychologist. And then, huh? Panky? Walter? Panky? No, it's Walter something else. You're right, you're pretty close. Um, I forget. Walter Michel. Walter, Walter Michel, mm -hmm. yes. And then it was repeated recently, and you can see those cute videos online. Uh, it was uh, by this very famous psychologist whose books are standard textbooks in all psychology classes. He repeated those experiments. The experiment is very simple, you know. You put a marshmallow before a little kid, uh, four or five years, and there's a reason why they have to be four or five years. Not more than that, not less than that. Because at that age, you know, they begin to understand the instructions, and yet they don't have full control over themselves. So, uh, do you want a marshmallow? And the kid says yes. Uh, do you want two? And every kid says yes. And it's being recorded, you can see that. 
um, then the psychologist says that all, all right um, you I'll put one marshmallow before you and I'm going out for some work I'll be back you wait if you wait and you don't eat that marshmallow I'll give you two then you can eat two marshmallows now the interesting thing is every kid said I want two every kid said I will wait but the, the interesting thing was not all kids could wait the psychologist leaves the room and then you can see the videos you see it on YouTube marshmallow experiment it's, it's a very very cute very funny the kids some of them they stare so helplessly at the door because <laughs> if the at that age if somebody's gone for five minutes or ten minutes it's an age it's an eternity some kids uh, they distract themselves from the marshmallow by playing games or something like that some stare helplessly at the marshmallow <laughs> and then eat it and there was one little kid who said, I'll wait. And the moment the psychologist was out of the door, he says, I didn't even close the door. He ate it immediately. <laughs> Not only that, when the psychologist came back, he said, give me the next one. Give me the other one. <laughs> Clearly, no understanding of causality. That If then, if you do this, you will get this. Now, what, what, what Walter Michel did was, he just recorded. In, uh, the initial experiments were not videotaped. It was just recorded. Who ate the marshmallow and who did not. Then he followed up the kids over 20 years of their lifespan and he found on the average, this is on the average, the kids who were able to control their desire for the marshmallow and did not eat it as promised and they got the second marshmallow, they did well on almost every aspect of life. In studies, in you know sports, in whatever demanded a little bit of effort, they were also the popular kids, the parents and teachers had no problem with them. And the kids who ate the marshmallow, again, on the average, again, you, you can't pick out individual kids, on the average, they were the ones who did not do the homework, who were out partying, who didn't listen to, uh, they would make a commitment and not hold on to it. Basically, that's the thing, make a commitment, not hold on to it. And the psychologist pointed out, this the second set of experiments, this, this understanding or lack of understanding of causality, that if I hold back the ability to postpone gratification this is the word used ability to postpone gratification if I hold back now and put in some effort the end result is going to be better and um, you know more two marshmallows instead of one and that's real but the real the problem is what's in front is literally sensorily real and the other thing is a matter of understanding those who are able to follow through with their understanding they did well throughout preschool school grade school you know university and probably later on in life and in you know uh, jobs and families whatever this is the understanding of the psychology behind karma uh, to a greater degree um, this is from positive psychology in vedanta there are these four categories of people they talk about one is called the palmer the instinctive person the person who follows the pleasure instinct straight away fear or pleasure whatever it is follows it straight away and all it, it could it could be a highly educated person it could be a kid so from and they, they have a whole range from the addict who lives for the next you know next hit next bit of um, you know alcohol or drugs to um, the person who who is a might be an expert uh, in some field and can't help plagiarizing other people's work. It could be a whole range of people, but they can't help themselves. So that's called Palmer, instinctive. So they just live for what is called Artha Kama. Um, artha mean pleasure, Kama means pleasure, Artha means wealth, success. They'll do anything for that. As long as the police or the IRS doesn't catch them, then they're, they're okay. The next level is those who understand causality. They also want pleasure and success in this world. They're all worldly people, the same category Sri Ramakrishna talks about. And, but they know that if they live a moral life, an ethical life, then it's a sustainable life. Luckily, most people in society fall in this category, what you would call, at least they think of themselves as decent people. We have some standards. We won't sing to, there's certain things that we won't do, even if it promises you instant success. So that second level is called dharmika vishayi. Vishayi, worldly person, one who wants worldly things. But dharmika, they have a code of honor, they have a certain moral standard, and they understand causality. Good karma brings good things. 
you you put in the effort you will get something out of it so they, they are, these are people who generally build up their lives on the average successful better communities better families better jobs and so on i mean they do well in life then comes the third level according to vedanta which is where the positive psychology hasn't gone yet just beginning to sort of is what sri ramakrishna calls those who understand that even this kind of worldly sustainable good worldly life will not give you fulfillment there is a higher spiritual purpose god realization enlightenment whatever you call it so the third level is called sadhaka sadhaka means spiritual seeker spiritual practitioner what's the difference between them and the earlier the earlier stage they still want worldly things they're still going to the thorny um, bush um maybe they're just careful not to get cut so much <laughs> a careful camel who's <laughs> still nibbling on the same thorny bushes but uh but this person realizes there's something higher beyond all this and so their goal is moksha enlightenment not pleasure or um, wealth not artha and kama but dharma and moksha and then finally there's a fourth level which is called siddha perfected one who is not pursuing any any goal dharma artha kama moksha already enlightened yes. so in vedanta there are these four now in these four the top and the bottom are those who don't understand causality the bottom because uh, they somehow feel that it won't work in my case you know i can do whatever i like and i'll escape the consequences and the top the siddha enlightened one who sees causality for what it is it's maya it's not real causality so they are beyond causality and so there's a difference between being childlike and childish the bottom uh, the one is childish children can be childish that's cute but when you are above say 16 when you are 60 you can't be childish that's not cute anymore it can be destructive so that is the the bottom they they don't understand causality and the top they uh, understand um, and they they see that it's beyond causality reality is beyond causality they are child like but not childish in between other people who understand causality the one group understands causality and is applying it to doing well in the world and the other group knows that even this doing well in the world is limited they want to get the real stuff enlightenment god realization they also apply causality i will sadhaka means person who understands that doing spiritual practices leads to spiritual uh, results then yes but isn't brahman in all these four already yes not only in it is all of them huh. it is all of them that's the whole game of life uh, let me just add one little bit and uh, i mean i went on and on but i'll just compress what sri ram krishna is trying to say here is the levels of spiritual practice deeper and deeper the first level is ethics and that has to be based on cause and understanding of karma and causality clean up your life be ethical be moral those do's and don'ts are very helpful there you don't have to follow a particular code and follow the law <laughs> that's always a good idea and uh, follow your own particular code of conduct at least at least have a sense of decency or morality uh, if you particularly follow a religion then religions do prescribe um, codes of conduct then he says the next level is see this first level is i am doing good so that i get good in return the next level is i don't want worldly returns i am doing good because it purifies me makes me more spiritual more able to to pursue spiritual practice better i can meditate better i can pray more genuinely to god god becomes a reality for me and so that's why i am doing um a karma the same karma but i'm doing it selflessly maybe as a worship of god or for the welfare of others not for myself anymore so from the sanskrit words are very uh, instructive sakama karma to nishkama karma sakama means with desire i am honest i am a good person but i have worldly desires it's fine if you have worldly desires you will get the world and you will get it in a more sustainable way than the 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 impulsive the person who doesn't understand the the, the causality and then you must go from there to i am good because it is good to be good not because it will get me something because i am no longer interested in the prizes that the world has to offer i have seen through it 
now i am interested in something which is god realization enlightenment that becomes my project in life still causality applies there but it's now a higher kind of causality higher kind of karma it is called nishkama karma selfless action yeah all right i'll stop there uh, somebody had a question at the back uh, yes ram gopal why is the disconnect so age old question of humanity and the direct answer is disconnect is because of our impurity of mind so ram krishna says the whole point of these spiritual practices is to purify ourselves what is the impurity of mind such strong conditioning of the mind i want that thing you know it could be relationships it could be gadgets it could be um, drugs or alcohol whatever it is that i am unreasonably uh, attached to i want it even though i intellectually know there are limits i will not get fulfillment from this and there are terrible consequences of this even then i do it see i think it was plato or aristotle who said to know the good is to be good and we immediately react by saying no that's not true to know the good is to be good what is good i know and i'll always i'll do that in my life definitely but the, we immediately protest and say that that's not true because that's the whole problem in human life we know what is good but we are not good why not so I, uh, the philosopher had a great point here if you were truly rational if you were in possession of your faculties then if once you clearly know what something is good you would do it but the very fact that we know something and we clearly understand it and still we don't do it or we do we know that we shouldn't do it and we keep on doing it that shows something is wrong this whole question of guilt how strange is guilt i did something now i am self critical about myself how could i have done that how could i have said that how strange you did it it's almost like we are two persons so where does that come from that comes from impurity of mind krishna so this is a difference i mentioned it earlier in the mahabharata you know the gita you always people think that krishna taught the gita to arjuna but he should have taught the gita to the, the villains the the bad guys what's the point in teaching the, the scriptures to a good person the person is going to be good anyway and you know your credit is if you can turn the bad guy around but krishna did try to teach duryodhana the villain but the result was not good before the war krishna goes and tells duryodhana the villain because of whom, of whom the war took place that uh, what you are doing is not dharma it is against dharma it's against righteousness you shouldn't do this and duryodhana's reply was um i know that i know what i'm doing is wrong he's is really honest but my problem is not that i don't know what is right and wrong i know what is right and wrong but my problem is what is right i don't feel like doing it and what is wrong i can't stop myself from doing it that's my problem and krishna had no answer to that <laughs> why no answer because no question was asked question should have been how do i change this how do i set myself right arjuna in the bhagavad gita asks the exact same question impelled by what force does a man unwillingly do wrong things again and again anuchchan api varshneya bala deva niyojita why does a person do wrong things even though not willing has made up his mind that i will resolution new year's resolution i won't do this anymore i won't behave like that anymore and so on and so forth and commits the same error again and again as if by some force within this force within duryodhana also noted that verse is there janami dharma na cha me pravritti janami adharma na cha me nivritti i know what is dharma i don't feel like doing it i know what is adharma i can't stop myself from doing it why not kenapi devena hridi sthitena yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi there is some force some psychic power within me as it is impelling me that's how i'm acting that's the age old existential crisis of humanity from you know across all civilizations we have faced it is something within me which doesn't even while knowing what is right i still can't do it and the answer in yoga is provided by yoga is that the conditionings of the mind so duryodhana just said it i can't do anything else about it it's just just the way i am arjuna didn't put it that way he said what is it that makes us behave this way and how can i change it 
how can i be better and then krishna answers him kamaesh krodhaesh rajaguna samudbhava mahashano mahapapma vidhyainam vairinam he says um lust and anger these are tremendously powerful they have conditioned our mind um they they are born of rajas they have they are in of insatiable hunger if i act according to my rage or anger will i be satisfied will i be peaceful forever after that absolutely not you won't be it might feel satisfactory for a moment will increase your unhappiness if i give in to my lusts and passions will i be uh, fulfilled afterwards no it will blaze forth even more so this is the thing and then how do we overcome that for that that is the answer to the question why has god put us in this world for that purpose so that when we have cleansed out cleansed out our minds and so that when it is a fact what the greek philosopher said to know the good is to be good it is possible when we have um, purified ourselves to know the good will be good then what we know what we study we will be able to do in our lives with minimal struggle yes uh, is there um uh, you know some some of us do not understand the laws of causality right causality yeah some of us do is there any inherently uh is there inherently evil and as opposed to inherently goodness and the two of them always in history face each other mm. out of that a good comes a new good comes sri sri lakshmi mm. you know the devas and the asura and it's, it's necessary that both are there yeah so that's not a way of thinking that is there in the dharmic religions it's a more abrahamic way of thinking what has happened is from from a vedantic perspective this this you know lack of understanding of causality one word for that would be ignorance so this is one of the aspects of ignorance and this ignorance is what leads to evil from not only vedanta in in fact all the indian philosophies buddhism also says the same thing the, the, the root cause is uh, ignorance agyana now this in the um three religions in uh, first of all in zoroastrianism and then in uh, christianity and islam uh, i don't know if it, i don't think judaism has a devil does it i don't think so. i haven't heard of it so in zoroastrianism christianity and islam this this cause which is the source of all trouble in personal life and in the world is projected outwards and personalized as evil as an as a reality evil as a reality as a separate reality that's one way of dealing with it but that kind of thinking vedanta doesn't agree what vedanta would say is that it's in it's in all of us and it's it's a, a continuum rather than black and white if you do black and white there's one way of dealing with it if you do continuum there's another way of dealing with it if you do a continuum from black to gray to you know pale white to um, absolutely pure the entire from darkness to light there's a whole range of um, then for example you can't condemn anybody as a, a person as entirely evil or a, a happening in the world or some kind of accident something as entirely evil you can't condemn so there will be some mixture of something that's good and positive which comes out of it so there's not an ontological evil yes ontological evil generally is not in the dharmic traditions yeah it's just a phenomenal evil yeah yeah um this ontological evil i guess you would trace it back to uh, zoroaster maybe zarathustra who yeah i think i i did not mean that i yeah. meant something like you know something in the realm of action you know we need that in the realm of action across history yeah we need these two forces right so this is you know you that's what you meant actually the, it, this uh, this idea which is in your mind it goes it's a ancient idea it goes back to ancient christianity islam but even before that the precursors of christianity and islam uh, i can't say about judaism because i don't know but clearly the breakthrough which zoroaster made was instead of a variety of deities let's just think about in this is in uh, ancient persia this just think about light and darkness ahura mazda and arhiman arhiman is 
I shouldn't even take the name. Huh? Is he, who, he who must not be named. So, yes, Aura Mazda is a, a force of light and fire. The, often the, the per Persians, the Zoroastrians are called fire worshippers. As one Zoroastrian told me in exasperation, we, had, we don't worship the fire. It's a symbol of light, of Aura Mazda. So, um, from there, so ontological evil, there is a force in the cosmos, in communities, among nations, in each person. And then that force has to be overcome by the force of light. And our Ramazda is going to help you, or God or Allah is going to help you. And you must take the, you must declare once for all whether you, it's, it's there in Zoroastrianism, you must declare once for all whether you're on the side of Ahura Mazda or Ahriman. And in the end, Ahura Mazda is going to win. It is going to be a terrible fight. You can see how this ontological evil, it's a very ancient idea, going all the way, way back to the Zoroastrians. But Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, none of the Indian religions think in that way. Uh, in Vedanta, evil is, evil is there, but evil is caused by ignorance. And so in order to overcome evil, one must overcome ignorance. And know who am I, what is the reality here, know that. This gentleman, before I come to you, yeah, she has been raising her hand for a while. Yeah, but notice what I said. I said something which is tricky and subtle. The ultimate, the perfected, what did I say about them? They are beyond causality. One might not pay attention to that, but that's, you're opening the gate for something quite dramatic there. The moment you say you're beyond causality, in general, Sri Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and all of them would say, such people will never do anything wrong. Because, because of the, con the long process of purification, spiritual practice, all the evil or most of it has been crushed out of them and their natures are good. So they are going to manifest goodness only. They are going to manifest the truth. However, it is also well understood, at least in Vedanta, in uh, Tantra, in Tibetan Buddhism, that you cannot make laws for the perfected. Laws are for us. Laws are for us, the two kinds of people in between. Worldly people who are decent, moral, who have a good you know, personal ethic, work ethic, they understand laws. And spiritual people, you know, we are all spiritual seekers, we understand the, the importance of causality. The, the laws are also not for the absolutely instinctive, because they don't believe, they, they are not going to follow it. They are not interested in that, until they learn with great suffering. You know, the bleeding, the camel which was bleeding. But the, the perfected ones, you cannot make laws for them. Even it's understood in Vedanta, for enlightened beings, Tita Pragya, the enlightened one of perfect wisdom, Jivan Mukta, enlightened while living. Uh, it's, a, it's a philosophical point that you cannot, you cannot say, now you're enlightened. So these are the ones, these are things that you have to follow now. You can't say that. Just literally they have gone beyond that. Um, but then there is this little footnote to it, which would be what you're talking about. Is it possible that they might do some things which don't tally with our, our understood morality? Uh, you have to leave it open. That's why the Tibetan Buddhists have this idea of crazy enlightened people. Uh, the Dalai Lama was once asked about it. He also um, gave a nuanced answer. He says it's quite possible that they may be highly spiritual. But it's also equally true it doesn't matter to you. You're not supposed to follow them. They might demonstrate something about spiritual life, which is somehow... So is it just morality? Is uh, spirituality just morality? No, it isn't. There's something beyond that. So they might, that might be one corner of it which they are demonstrating. But as he was very clear, you're not supposed to follow them. And Vedanta also is very clear about it. You're supposed to follow, the teacher is supposed to embody in his or her life the highest standards of ethics. And that's what we are supposed to follow, because otherwise it's harmful. For uh, It may not harm you if you think you are highly enlightened and beyond causality, but the rest of us are not beyond causality, and we will be harmed by such a, a poor example. The gentleman there. From, from what I could understand, the question is, no pain, no gain, I've heard. So, the camel, trying to get something is going through pain. But hasn't the enlightened one at the last level also gone through something? So should we go through pain to get the gain or should we not want the gain? Yeah. 
you cannot it is a good question so there is a pain involved in in going after something and so if the pain is too much then it's not worth it you don't worth it yeah you, game theory will tell you that <laughs> a calculus you set up and it'll tell you that yes but the thing is we can't stop um, vedanta will say you cannot stop because um, you are compulsively you're going to try to live compulsively you're going to try to be happy you can't stop trying to be happy you can be happy you can try in different ways one in a hedonistic way you can pursue pleasure and try to be happy in a stoic way stoicism by the way is uh, going through a great revival in the west especially here in new york uh-huh. massimo is there and so on so in a stoic way you can try to but still trying to be happy and both have to undergo some kind of pain and that's inevitable now what spiritual life t- tells you is there is an intelligent way of going about it and there is an unintelligent way of going about it unintelligent way is to keep on taking the pain and not and getting cheated every time yeah. not getting the gain we keep on taking the pain for example um, i was reading robert wright so he's written this book he's a uh, neo darwinist right here he lives in um, princeton or somewhere he has written this book the evolution of god why buddhism is uh, is true why buddhism is true? it was on the new york times best sellers list and so on. so he says i am a uh, uh, evolutionary biologist i'm 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 a scientist i understand the things which buddhism is telling me mm. uh, from an evolutionary perspective it is nature always has programmed us for her own ends to expect more pleasure than she is willing to give so whether it's a candy bar or any kind of sensuous pleasure uh, we feel it will be tremendously good it never is as good as you expected it to be most of the time you know, they have what you call a buyer's uh, depression you, you you buyer's remorse yes you buy it but it says the opportunity cost is there because you have bought it and that means you have given up something else you could have bought something else and then what you expected from it is less than what you got so he gives an example for example uh, this is well known in um, evolutionary biology he says this craving for sugar now it made tremendous sense when we were in the savannas in in africa and living in the grasslands there there was hardly any sugar available in natural form you had to get a rare fruit or something like that which was rich in sugar and you had to grab it when you got it because sugar is essential for your functioning but now we are surrounded by sugar everywhere we still have that craving Uh, bec- uh, and now it has become very unhealthy for us but we can't give it up because the craving is there inside uh, or any kind of sensuous pleasure so nature has imparted it in us for reproduction and then when we go through that we feel uh, it was not good enough maybe it will be better next time and that's exactly what nature wants nature wants you to think it will be great and when you do it it's not as great but nature wants you to think that if i repeat it again it will be get better because nature basically wants that nature doesn't want you to be satisfied either by sugar or anything else if you get satisfied you take one bar of sugar and you're satisfied that animal is going to die <laughs> nature wants you to live and continue doing what nature wants you to do so robert right says that all these things i know i know what's underneath my cravings and i i can't control it but what I, even by knowing all that i can't do anything about it i'm no different from the person who doesn't know evolutionary biology but then he says what buddhism spiritual practice meditation practice of moral life helped me to do was convert my knowledge into lived life i'm actually able to do something about it now yeah um anyway straight answer to your question no pain no gain correct whether in worldly life or in spiritual life and uh, but there's no way of going back for us we have to go through this vivekananda says you cannot run away from the machine you must learn how to work the machine and the machine will set you free the machine of causality you must learn how to work the machine how to learn to work the machine is through ethical life and then this selfless um, from selfish ethics to selfless ethics to to there are higher practices of spirituality yes get a bit there ignorance is at multiple levels one is as you just saw we are all talking about ignorance of causality yeah. even though we know about it we are, we are ignorant in a deep sense that we don't follow it we don't really believe in it or you know it's not a living reality for us that's what kind of ignorance in vedant in vedanta the ignorance is supposed to be about your real nature that you are brahman 
that everybody you deal with is Brahman. So as you said, you see, feel Brahman everywhere. Would it attenuate the effects of the ego? Yes. How is the ego attenuated? The effects of the ego are thinned out. How do you do that? Um, in uh, by Karma Yoga. In Karma Yoga, from selfish action to selfless. I used to do everything for I, me, myself, strengthening the ego more and more and more. But now reverse it. Let me use the time and energy and resources of this little person for the good of many. That, atten that reduces, attenuates the ego. Bhakti does it powerfully. The ego comes to face and face with, uh, to face with the personal God. This grand majestic presence of the God of the universe. So if you have faith in God, then the ego automatically, humility comes. Immediately. Then um, attention, training the power of attention through meditation. Meditation can attenuate the ego by calming the mind. The ego thrives in a restless mind. And then the highest of all I would say is the path of knowledge where you see that you are not the ego. Shankaracharya sings famously, Mano buddhya hankara chitta ninaham I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not the ego. Literally if you translate it is, I am not I. <laughs> that, how, how crazy is that? I am the consciousness that is the witness of the ego. Ego is just a function of the mind. I am not the ego. Yeah, so these are the ways in which you thin out the ego. Yes. Could Duryodhana's desire be influenced by Krishna? Could be. But then, um, here's, it's coming now. Somebody asks, why doesn't God free all of us? So, God could have just changed uh, Duryodhana. You might just say the whole thing was a play of Krishna's leader in order to instruct all of us. We see in ourselves a little bit of Duryodhana, a little bit of Arjuna. We are, we are all of those characters. Some lady, uh, you raised your hand at the back. Sure. That's a long, long debate. But I'll just tell you, whatever your concept of morality is, observe that the real struggle is there. Everybody has a concept of morality and everybody finds it difficult. I can reduce my, lower my level of morality, my concept of morality to the point where I find it easy, where whatever I like doing is moral. I will myself know that it, it's, I'm not true to, to being true to myself and I I'm, I'm, know I'm cheating then. So the moment I have a concept of morality, whatever it is, um, I'll find it's difficult. Why is it difficult? If it's my standard of morality, why is it difficult for me to follow it? Everybody finds it difficult to follow. That struggle. It's only when it's imposed, this is the standard of morality, then we rebel. Why this? It's, then we say morality is relative. So big de debates about um, moral relativism, all that will arise. But alright, given all of that, you have your own standard of mor morality. Why is it difficult to follow? So th that's what Sri Ramakrishna is pointing out. That our minds are so deeply conditioned, those impurities are there. And, said, um, and we are all doing it. You may question it, but the very fact that you are here, if you are seeking a, some kind of a higher life, a spiritual life, that itself, that struggle is the struggle to be a better person. So spiritual life starts with being a better person, a selfless person, a calmer person, and a more wise person, more loving person. I put in all the yogas there. <laughs> the lady at the very back, did you have a question? You had raised your hand. It's true. Um, if I'm traumatized, if I have... See, in basically any of these, these things which you say that it has reduced your autonomy of action, your degrees of freedom. That person is not as free to follow certain practices as the rest of us might be. All right, then help that person to the extent that they can. You know, medicine will be helpful, counseling will be helpful. But what they have found is um, our own autonomy is very important, which is what the distinction Krishna made between Duryodhana and Arjuna. Why is Duryodhana the villain and Arjuna the uh, hero when they asked more or less the same question? Arjuna wanted to change, right? So, yes, you can have uh, psychotherapy, you can have, uh, you can medicate a person, all those will help. But nowadays, I think the most popular thing is what they call cognitive behavior therapy, where the person is vitally, crucially involved in his or her own therapy. I remember the psychiatrist in India, uh, he had this very beautiful idea of, he says, the progress should be from patienthood to patienthood to personhood to human excellence. 
you can't remain a patient. You must become a person again. And from person to human excellence. And he says his therapy, he says, I, I think as a doctor, as a psychiatrist, I cover the whole spectrum. I would like to help you from being entirely helpless uh, through medication maybe. I'll help you there. And then from moving from medication to counseling, from counseling to you take charge of your own life, and then you become a source of help to others. You go to that extent where you are helping everybody else. He would always give us the example. I mean, he had a PowerPoint presentation. He would show two examples. One, he would show a picture of Stephen Hawking. Another one, he would show a picture of... Um, um, what's his name? Um, the He was here in Princeton. He won the Nobel Prize. Um, the Beautiful Mind. John Nash. John Nash, yes. So here's this person whose limbs don't work at all. He has this, um, uh, you know, um, ac cumulative um, this nervous disorder, which uh, degenerative nervous disorder, which is totally paralyzed, and yet his mind is ranging all over the cosmos with a devastated body. What a mind! You can range all over the cosmos and do tremendous groundbreaking work in cutting edge physics, cosmology. Here is a my man, another man, John Nash, whose mind is devastated, schizophrenic. And yet he does work that gives, gets him the Nobel Prize, even after all those, at those times the pre treatments were pretty crude. Even then he goes on doing maths all his life and economics. Uh, so from person, it can be done, even in, in very difficult circumstances. And to a level that's not only the same as the rest of us, far higher than the average of humanity. Yeah. Let me just go a little further. And make a few comments and stop because we have run out of time. Um, so all of this, then the question, next question would uh, would be, why doesn't God free us from the world? Then let just free us from the world. Let uh, God do everything and we'll be f uh, free. It doesn't work that way. In fact, he says God is doing that. This is the process. It's just that we want it instantaneously. It's done in God's good time, over many many lifetimes. There's a funny story of uh, read in Reader's Digest that. Um, uh, you know, uh, he, he had heard, this man had heard, God is so vast, you know. Uh, so, what, whatever a, a human, our money is like nothing to him, God is infinitely wealthy and so on. So he prayed and prayed, prayed to God and God appeared before him and he said, what do you want? And the man said, oh not much, I just want one cent of your money, which is equal to several billions of our money, you know. So, just one cent from you which will surely be billions of our dollars at, you know, for human beings. And God said, Go, okay, wait one second. <laughs> wait a second, which might be millions of years. So God is freeing us. Sri Ramakrishna says he will free us when the disease is cured. When you are admitted to a hospital, we have a lot of hospital <laughs> examples, analogies today. When you are admitted to a hospital, you can't run away. The doctor will not let him go unless his illness is completely cured. So the faster we become healthy, uh, we, it's very interesting, the uh, Sanskrit word and many Indian languages, the word for health is swasthya. Swasthya means being established in your real nature. And that's the word for health, literally the word for health. Health centers are called swasthya kendra. So swasthya means uh, centered in your real nature. That's health. Okay, last observation. Because we have some amount of freedom, whatever our circumstances, if we try to do the best that we can, it becomes better and better. But the whole goal is not to make it better and better. The whole goal is to be free of this cycle of, uh, you know, of cause and effect. How do, how do we reduce that um, past karma? The effects of past karma, yes. You want a loophole, yes. <laughs> There's a story of a, of a lawyer, I'm sure he was from New York, so he was an atheist all his life and then he was critically ill, he was in the hospital and his friend came to see him uh, and then he found to his amazement uh, the man was lying on his bed, deathbed maybe, and reading a Bible carefully. And they asked him, you are reading a Bible, why suddenly what are you doing? And he said, no, I'm working the case, I'm looking for loopholes. Because <laughs> that's where I'm going now, so I want to see the <laughs> whole loopholes in the law there. <laughs> yes. 
spiritual direct answer to your question spiritual practice reduces the effects of past bad karma the holy mother has said that if you do spiritual practice like japa like prayer like good works for others then whatever is coming to us the bad effects of that are reduced she said where one would have lost a leg one will feel a pin prick why would that be it's that's illogical right does god play favorites shouldn't god be perfectly strict with that no in vedanta in fact why vedanta any theistic religion in vedanta the what's the point of all of this then why are we at all here and the goal is enlightenment god realization that's what's happening the whole of life is driving us towards it if you are on the straight and narrow path that means towards god realization then god is on your side because you are doing what god wants you to do in that case it won't do to scare you off with sudden burst of bad karma you know and so god will be favorable things will go but the moment you stray off from this side or that side all of that bad karma is going to come come down on you like a ton of bricks so it, uh, god will help us to stay on on the path and if you stray away from the path all sorts of things will kick in which will again bring us back to the seeking and you need not bring god into it at all the buddhist has the exact same logic without bringing god into it at all it's just the way the universe is designed it will force us towards enlightenment om shanti 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 hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namaste